I hope you have your Bibles with you this morning. Uh, you can uh, certainly look at it on your, on your app, on your phone, or I hope you have your Bible. There's a Bible in the pew rack, and we're going to be in John chapter 10 this morning, and we're going to be looking at verses 27 through 30. John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30. Last year, on June the 23rd, a junior soccer team and their assistant coach entered the Tom Loon Nong Nan Cave in Thailand. Shortly after they entered the cave, monsoon rains on the outside flooded parts of the cave, making it impossible for the team to get out of the cave. It took nearly a week for rescuers to make contact with the team. Thousands of people from all over the world were involved in putting a plan together to rescue the team. The team was, uh, it's an understatement to say that they were in danger of perishing in the rising floodwaters in the cave. And yet, ultimately, over three days, on July the 8th, 9th, and 10th, an international team of divers swam through the murky waters of the cave, came to the team, and one by one, they swam them out to safety. And the last, the last one of the team was actually saved and safe on July the 10th. Really an amazing feat that captured the attention of the world. Spiritually, we are in a similar state. The Bible says that we are trapped. We are lost in our trespasses and sins. Romans 3.23 reminds us for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 is so graphic, it says... But the wages of sin is death. We are in danger of being engulfed in the lake of fire, or to put it bluntly, hell. Just as the actions of that junior soccer team entering the cave put them in peril, so our sinful actions put us at odds with the holy God and put us in peril of perishing. But God. In the greatest rescue mission spanning eternity, sent his son into the world. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That is the nutshell of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we accept his help by faith. And we repent of our sins, and we seek His forgiveness, and we commit our lives to Him, then He rescues us from the peril of perishing for all eternity. I love the way Paul wrote about it in the book of Colossians, in chapter 1 and verse 13. For He, speaking of Jesus, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I want to speak this morning on the topic, safe if saved. At the heart of the words of Jesus Christ in John 10, 27 through 30, the security of the believer. Once saved, always saved. I know people get all up in arms about the doctrine of once saved, always saved. But the truth is, it's never a matter of whether a person can always be saved. The question is always whether a person was ever once saved. But once a person is saved, just as those boys, once they were out of the cave on dry land and reunited with their families, were safe, once a person has been saved, covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, then they are safe for all eternity. Listen to what Jesus said. As we begin in John chapter 10 and in verse 27, he describes a relationship. 
Now, Jesus talks about sheep in this passage, but we know he's not really talking about sheep. He's talking about you and me. We are the sheep. Verse 27, in John chapter 10, as he opens this passage, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Jesus is describing a relationship here. You hear his voice, and therefore, because you hear his voice, you respond. You're walking with him, and you're following him. It is a relationship. We've all had the experience of having somebody ask us, do you know a certain person? And we would say, well, not really. I, I, I know who they are, or I know about them, but I really do not know them. They're an acquaintance. They're somebody at work. But I really can't say that I know them. Jesus did not say, I know about them. He did not say that they are my acquaintances. He didn't say, well, I can just, you know, identify them. Jesus says, I know them. When you are in relationship with someone, then you communicate and you have conversation and, and you do things together. There's interaction that's there. And it's just a constant reminder that this verse gives us a picture that in Christ we have a relationship with very God through Jesus Christ. Christianity, yes, is categorized as a religion, but it is a relationship with Jesus Christ. So the question I would ask you this morning before we go any further is, do you know Jesus and does Jesus know you? Yeah, he knows about you, but are you in a relationship with him? And the way to move into a relationship with Jesus Christ is to acknowledge what we all know and the Bible tells us is that we are sinners. And it is to, to, to reach out to Jesus Christ and ask for his forgiveness and to commit your life to him, trusting him that he died for your sins, he paid the price, that he rose again, that he is the only Savior, that he is the one who gives eternal life. And when you do that, you move into a relationship with Jesus Christ. How is it that a person can be safe if saved? Someone will ask, invariably, you mean a person who becomes a Christian can do whatever they want to do and still go to heaven? Remember, the issue is never can God always save it is if that person is really saved. Many people misunderstand the nature of salvation. So let's dive in. A person who is saved, who has committed their life to Jesus Christ, is safe if saved. Why? Because salvation is the gift of God. Look at verse 28. The first part of that verse. Jesus said of his sheep, those who know him... I give them eternal life. Let's stop right there. It is important for us to understand what Jesus did not say. He did not say, well, they've been in church for 23 straight years. Their attendance has been pretty good, and they've served in X number of positions. Oh, and they've been baptized, so they have earned the right to to have eternal life. So I'm going to give them eternal life. Jesus did not say, well, they deserve eternal life because they're a good person and a good husband and because they're a good worker and because they're, they're moral. That's not what he said. Jesus said, I give them eternal life. It's a gift. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. When we moved to Alvin, when I accepted being the pastor at South Park Baptist Church in spring of 2011, we had a very difficult time finding housing. We... Rented a house for about a, a year, 
and then we bought a home that had been a foreclosure and went through all the normal process of inspections and et cetera. But, but after we closed, in, in between that one day, that one day when we did the walkthrough and everything was hunky-dory, in between that time and closing, someone had broke into the home and had stolen all the copper, the copper coils from the two air conditioner units. They had pulled all the copper wiring so that when we went to move in, guess what? We had no lights, we had no air conditioning, and we had already closed. So we, obviously, we were in a, a bind, and we had to extend our, our lease, and, you know, we shared the prayer request with the church family. Well, one day, a man called and wanted to come see me, longtime member of the church, Bobby Verdine, an educator. He had been uh, principal for many, many years at one of the elementary schools, also been in administration some. What I guess one of the most admired men that I've ever known. He, he trained countless teachers and had influence on, on, on just thousands of children over the years. So Bobby came to see me. And he sat down, and he began to cry. And he said, Howard, uh, there's something that, that God wants me to do and that I want to do, and I don't want you to say anything about it. And then he reached across my desk, and he handed me a check. Before I even looked at it, I said, Now, Mr. Verdine, um, you, you don't need to give me any money. He said, Oh, yes, I do. And he had big crocodile tears coming down. I turned the check around and looked at it, and it was made out to me for $5,000. Mr. Verdine got up without saying a word, and I said, Mr. Verdine, I can't. And he waved me off with tears coming down his face and walked out of my office. Now, I want to tell you, I did not deserve that money. But Bobby Verdown, out of his love and grace, gave us a gift to help us get the house in order. That's a gift. And if you're counting, a little over four months, Christmas will be here. Some of you are counting and looking at the calendar. And we will exchange Christmas presents. And when you give a gift to someone... It's not because they deserve it. It's not because they've earned it. They're not paying for it. You give it to them because you love them and because the, that you're in a meaningful relationship with them. And when someone gives you a gift, it's not because you deserve it or you've earned it. It's out of grace and out of love. And in the same way, when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, He gives you and me the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life. You receive it by faith. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. He gives it to you. And therefore, the very nature of salvation, you are safe is saved because salvation is the free gift of God. What an amazing gift. The greatest gift any person could ever have is the gift of salvation, eternal life, knowing that you have a relationship with God now and that one day you will be with Him forever. But there's more. We find in this passage that not only are you safe if saved because salvation is the gift of God, but also because of the guarantee of God. I love guarantees. I know more about guarantees now when I got into the real estate business than I did before. A guarantee is is much stronger than just a warranty on your appliance or something. A guarantee actually is contractual. And so the one who makes the guarantee surety and the one who receives it, the creditor, the one who is the obligee, and so it is contractual, and it's in the language of real estate contracts and other contracts as well. Here we have... In the contract of God, the Word of God, the living Word of God, the guarantee of God. He says, I give them eternal life, and those next words, 
and they shall never perish. Those words are so incredibly strong. A literal translation would be, and they shall never not perish. Now that's terrible English, but it's very strong, a double negative in the Greek New Testament. They shall never not perish. That's the words of very God. That if you are in relationship with him, that if you believe in him, that you shall never perish. It's John 3.16 that I quoted earlier. That if you believe in him, you shall never perish, but have eternal life. Revelation puts it this way, that, that the second death, which is when a person goes to hell when they die, shall have no power over them. Romans 8 puts it this way, that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it lists all those things that we battle in this life, and yet nothing can separate us from the love of God when you're in relationship with Him. And here we have the very guarantee of God that if you're in relationship with Him, that if you're saved, that you're safe for all eternity and shall never perish. It would be a terrible thing, and too many people live this way, having one foot in heaven and one foot out, never really knowing if they are saved or if they are lost. Friend, God does not intend for you and I to live that way. In summarizing the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, John writes, I have written these things to you who believe in the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life, period. Absolutely nails it with that verse. God wants you to have the assurance, the knowledge, the, the absolute ability to go through anything in this life and to know that he has got you covered both now and in all eternity. As he said in John 14, 6, I go to prepare a place for you. And, that, and, and he says to the disciples and to you and me that one day I'll come back that you may be with me. That is the guarantee of Jesus Christ. By the way, when there's a guarantee, you have to have the authority. You have to have the authority to back up that guarantee. Matthew 28, 18, just before Jesus ascended, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In other words, the buck stops with me, gang. I'm Jesus Christ, and all the powers of the universe and of authority in every realm in this life and in the life to come reside in me and no one can stand in my way. And the one who has all authority says, when you commit your life to him and you will never perish. By the way, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18 tells us that it is impossible for God to lie. If you do not believe, John three sixteen. If you do not believe this, this little guarantee here in John 10, then you must believe that Jesus Christ is a liar. Not only in those verses, but throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, we find that thread all the way through that a believer is once saved, always saved. Safe is saved by the very guarantee of God. But there's more. You're safe if saved because salvation is the gift of God. You're safe if saved because of the guarantee of God. And you're safe if saved because of the greatness of God. I love the latter part of this passage. In verse uh, 28, Jesus said, No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. 
we often have the wrong the wrong picture of salvation we see ourselves as just sort of holding on with sweaty slippery palms just you know hoping that we won't slip and uh that just you know we'll just get into heaven not the picture it's not even the picture that God is reaching down and holding on to us not the picture the picture is that that you and I when we commit our lives to Jesus Christ are in the very palm of God Isaiah 48:13 God says my hand laid the foundations of the earth and the very hand that laid the foundations of the earth you are in the palm of his hand when you commit your life to him when my children were young you probably had the same experience you'd put a a rock or a piece of candy in your hand and they would try to get it out and they'd try to pry your fingers open and they may hang on and they'd say please daddy please and you could even pick them up and they would pry and pry but it, it, as much as they tried they did not have the strength to pry my hands open no, it was not until I finally said, okay, and the game was over, that I opened my hand. See, see, you're in the very palm of God. We used to sing the old song, he's got the whole world in his hands. Remember? He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby in his hands. Oh, and by the way, he had... He has you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. That is the picture of salvation. That when you commit your life to Jesus Christ, it's not you and me trying to hang on to God, but we are planted firmly in the very palm of God. And he has us by all authority and all power, wrapped up, safe and secure, for all eternity because of the greatness of God. I know there's some still here today that probably doubt. And I would feel sorry for you because God wants you to have the assurance of salvation. And there's still that question out there, well, so-and-so, they were a church member, they were baptized, and now they're walk way out in left field well again joining the church does not make you a Christian it does not save you being baptized does not save you serving in the church does not save you it is a faith and heart commitment to Jesus Christ I can't know if a person is truly saved or not only God really knows that but I know this, once a person is truly saved, based on the contract and the living word of God and the words of Jesus Christ himself, once a person commits their life to him, they are safe if saved. You know, David was a great Old Testament believer. In fact, he's called a man after God's own heart. Remember David? So much of the Old Testament centers around David. And yet in his later years, though he was a mature believer, David fell terribly spiritually. He had an affair with a married woman. In fact, the woman was married to one of his best soldiers. A soldier was out in the field. The woman got pregnant. He tried to cover it up, and so he had the soldier come home from the battlefield, hoping he would go to his house and sleep with his wife and everything would be okay. But the soldier would not go home to his wife because the army of Israel was out in the battlefield. He slept at the, at the, with the servants at the gate of the palace. So finally, David orchestrated a plan to have Uriah the Hittite killed in battle sent a note by his own hand to the general that had him put in the, in the very heat of the battle, in the front lines, and, and where the troops would withdraw to be sure that Uriah was killed. He committed murder. Adultery, murder, cover-up, lying, 
That's the stuff of, of movies, isn't it? And he went for a period of time where he didn't apparently acknowledge God. Psalm 51, Psalm 32, you can read those psalms. It details what was going through David's heart and mind spiritually. But ultimately, he was confronted by Nathan the prophet, and David came clean. He repented, and he, re he returned in his walk with God. Was David an Old Testament believer before the affair and murder? Yes. Was David a believer after that experience? Yes. He did an egregious sin. He did a horrible thing. And yet still the Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. If we confess our sins, church, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can't judge another person's salvation, but if a person is once saved, truly saved, they can have assurance that they are safe if saved because salvation is the very gift of God, the guarantee of God, and the greatness of God. That's the kind of God that we need to tell people about out here at work and all around, that when our God saves, he saves to the uttermost. Lord Jesus, we love you and we praise you, and we're in awe at what you have done for us. You are our great God, our rescuer, our redeemer. You left all the glory and splendor of heaven to come to this sinful earth, took on human flesh and, and became a man. And you went to the cross as the sacrificial lamb of God, and you died for our sins. You paid the price. Your blood was shed. You were put in the grave. And three days later, you rose again, pro proving the victor over sin, death, and hell. And you are the one who gives eternal life. I pray that all our hearts would turn to you. I pray for that person here today who has doubted their salvation, that, Lord, they would leave here today assured, knowing that they are safe if saved. I pray for that person here this morning who's maybe yet to commit their life to you fully and completely, that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, work in our hearts and lead us to respond to the moving and prompting of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Let's sing together. Let's draw close to our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ.